Hello, Hunter. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for the time. Uh, for the rest of you, Hunter is an author, entrepreneur, and a questioner. He loves asking questions. He is the founder president of Thrive Plan, where he mixes neuropsychology with market research, sociology with marketing, all to discover what, why people really do what they do. This is his book, which I fell in love with, Brand Be Nimble. It was one of the books that you buy and it piles on. There's a Japanese word for it. I didn't realize, but thanks to the times now when I, the cover is lovely. It's different. It doesn't look like your regular book. And that prompted me to pick it up and finish it. Um, well, I finished it up in a couple of days, not continuous reading Hunter, but uh, <laughs> you laid it out with the, uh, some books you just love to pick up and finish up at one go. And this is um, one such book. Uh, thank you very much for writing it Hunter. Um, what went behind writing the book hunter brand be nimble yeah so the, so the origin of the, that book and, and thank you for the compliments and, and and some of the observations all of that you know was very intentional we didn't want it to be a you know a business book that looks like a business book we wanted it to be somewhat entertaining but the, the origin of it um, is that I've been working with big brands, big global organizations for you know my whole career. Um, and uh, probably 10 years ago, I started uh, being a mentor and, um, and, and advisor to um, a startup accelerator here in Cincinnati that's called The Brandery, um, where uh, aspiring startups come in and, and get access to you know experts and advisors. And, and what, what uh, became very apparent is that all of the startups were saying, oh, you work with huge global brands. How do they do it? And all the huge global brands were saying, oh, you work with startups, how do they do it? And so the origin of the book and the name, and as, as you see on the little flag that she's waving, it's how big brands um, can thrive by innovating like startups. It really is just taking the principles um, from that startup world and, and showing bigger organizations how they can, they can act nimbly, um, but, but at a larger scale. And when I was writing the book, you know, publishers and people said, well, no, 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 you're doing it backwards. You need to write it for entrepreneurs. That's who's going to buy a lot of books. Tell them the secrets of big companies. And I think there's a lot of books and a lot of content like that. So reversing it and, and really writing it to serve, you know, my clients, uh, these bigger organizations, whether, whether a major global organization or just an established company, that, that was the, the goal. Uh, that's lovely. I'm, I'm an outlier marketer and I love the fact that you reversed uh, the, the thinking. And you mm -hmm. did it. But I'd love to question you. I would love to know what went behind the design of the book cover, Hunter. It is quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I want my goal in, in the cover artwork um, was to make it something you'd want to pick up. So, you know, we use a lot of behavioral science in our work and, and, and you, uh, you know, you're familiar with the system one, system two, some of the buzzwords, you know, system one being the emotional side, you know, the feels, the things that drive our behavior pre-consciously um, and, and, you know, sort of using our own, our own science on ourselves. I said, look, no, it makes a lot of sense what most business books look like. Um, and there are some, certainly some very cool cover artwork out there, but I said, look, first and foremost, this should look like something that you, you want to pick up. And I think you even said that. Um, so we said, look, what's a, what's a metaphor, what's an analogy and a, one of my teammates um, who's a very talented, you know, designer and illustrator sort of, sort of penned and drafted um, that, that old circus poster um, uh, uh, artwork and, and of course the nimble and, you know, she's balancing on the horse and things. There's lots of metaphors with the whole system one, system two, horse and rider analogy. And that all just sort of came together. Brilliant. And this is something I picked up from uh, Seth Godin's The Marketing School. And one of the lessons was, just to put a few covers that um, that impacted us mm -hmm. and our explanation. And I had about 50 other classmates comparing and asking me questions all based on the covers. And I could look at other book covers that made us stop and think, hey, there's so much that goes behind a cover. Now, I'm mm -hmm. going to question you on something that is in the book. And you've also written a few articles about it, which is identifying your constant. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you have clearly mentioned that it comes naturally for startups but for the uh, medium to large businesses, they will really need to find or identify their constant. I would love your thoughts on that, Hunter. Sure. Yeah. You know, so, so the analogy I, I think I use in the book is that, you know, imagine you walk into an, uh, a classroom, you know, in, in high school or in, 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 you know, elementary school, and there's an equation of X plus Y plus Z equals. 
And the analogy was that is the that is essentially what most big organizations do. They're trying to solve an equation, what we sometimes call the innovation equation, without a constant. And and the point is, in in basic algebra, you can't do it. You you know, x plus y plus z is not a solvable. Now, maybe I'm not a mathematician, but somebody's probably saying, "Oh, yes, it is. Here's how you do it." But for you know, for us mortals, it's sort of like, no, you can't you can't solve it. Um, and so, in the startup world, they have a constant, often a problem that they're trying to solve, an audience that they're trying to serve, um, a technology that they've invented, and really, those are the three components um, that that when we're guiding larger organizations, it's look, think about the audience, that's one that can be your constant. Um, what's the felt need or the, you know, the, the problem you're trying to solve, that's the second. And then the third is what's the technology. Um, and, and it's a simple equation, but even big companies, once they look at it and say, well, we know we want to address, you know, young generation Z, you know, or, and, and sometimes this is inherent in, in, these, um, in these projects, but it's just a simple framework that lets us step back and say, can we define the audience or is that really the question? Do we know the problem or is that really the question? Do we, is there a technology that we know we're trying to apply or use? Is that really the, the, the opportunity? And from there, the others, you can work against that constant. Um, simple but effective and sometimes a blinding glimpse of the obvious when you're approaching these big amorphous uh, challenges that, that brand teams find themselves, uh, you know, encountering. Oh, this is, this is brilliant. Uh, that's, um, in a way, what my book coach said, that figure out who you're writing for, anchor it, and then build everything around it for them, which is more or less how you've written the book as well, Brand Be Nimble, for your specific set of clients. That's right. Uh, yeah. To me, that is micro-marketing. But the other one that hit me straight up front, I think it comes in the second chapter, is where you mention uh, weak ties and mm -hmm. how they are far more important. It's not just my close friends who care for me, but it's friend of friends who are ideally going to help me out from a networking part. And I would request you to dwell a little bit on uh, the weak ties that you've mentioned in the book, Hunter. Yeah, yeah. I, I think where it comes through in most of our work is what we'd call um, perceptual frame of reference. So what I mean by that is marketers often get very caught up in the uh, – you know, which, which brands are to the left and right, what, what is, you know, what we call their literal frame of reference, their literal competitors. Um, and, and, you know, the way we use that weak ties application, that, you know, there's strong ties between Pepsi and Coke or, you know, two different salty snacks or two different insurance carriers. Those are, those are strong ties between them, their direct competitors. But the perceptual frame, the weak ties to other, other contexts um, or, or other um, factors in a person's context in their everyday life, that's where there's a lot of opportunity. And so that's where, you know, when we use the, um, the what we call neuropsychology, the, the, the pre-conscious um, understanding, we're, we're not just looking at why did, you know, why are they choosing Pepsi over Coke or, or MetLife over Aetna or whatever. We're looking at what is it um, that they perceive as like those things? What are the weak ties in their mind? And if you stop and reflect on things, you do have these connotation, and I'm making this hand gesture, the, the, the visual in the book is sort of a, a spoken wheel, almost a mo you know, a molecule. Um, you know, when you stop and think about, you know, your coffee or your laptop or whatever, you know, product or brand you're thinking of, it has lots of things that are like it or that are related to it, but that you're not necessarily buying instead of it. Um, and so uh, that, that's the, the basic concept of weak ties and, and something that we try to apply um, in helping uh, open the aperture and understand, you know, what, what's really framing perceptions in people's minds. This is brilliant. And the third and final one that I want um, to bounce off you is the concept of run to space that you've mentioned. You've used a beautiful uh, American football analogy. Where did that come from and how is that applicable to brands? Yeah, well, so the analogy is, um, is, is one of my coaches um, growing up would say, you know, playing, playing soccer um, would say, you know, look, don't go where the ball is, go where it's going to be. Run to, run to space. I mean, literally, he taught me that, run to open space. And that became, you know, very effective. And anyone um, in, in, a, in, in that sport um, understands, you know, the importance of going, moving into open space to advance the ball. You know, the analogy fits exactly in, in the world of brands. Um, and one of the examples that I give in the in the book is where a brand, um, a special K in the U.S., was trying to expand into um, into bars um, and the bar space at that time was very crowded and packed. And so they actually moved it into the pharmacy section, which was a very 
very slow turning, very antiquated um, section for most retailers, but one where they had a lot of interest. And, and of course now pharmacy is huge business for a lot of those and not, not necessarily thanks to that move. But the point was in that case, they literally found the opportunity to pivot over um, into a into a white space where, where all the competition, all the pressure um, wasn't present um, and, and grew from, you know, a very small sort of inconsequential brand to over a billion dollar brand um, with those types of moves. So, you know, moving and of course, there's a million, a million examples out there of, of where brands um, pivoted and moved into into space. Um, the, you know, the analogy I often give is if you walk into a retailer and look around, there's nothing that the world needs. You know, there's no open space, you know, brand teams talk about white space. Um, there is no white space. There's nothing that's not occupied by something. So, you know, looking for those um, opportunities to, um, you know, to really shift, you know, disrupt some of those buzzwords that you hear. Um, that's the principle. And there's, you know, there's some examples and I, you know, I, I spell out a few, um, a few sort of assessment tools or, or thought process you can go through to think about how you find space to run into when you're not on a pitch that there's an obvious <laughs> space to run towards. Lovely for all those tuning in, Brian, be nimble, and we have uh, Hunter here. We covered identifying your constant, weak ties, run to space, all of which is in the first couple of chapters. And then you've got a whole lot more that I learned from a brand bootstrapping to me, enthusiasm test as a key part, the mm -hmm. wedge edge that you spoke about, Hunter, which um, reflected quite a lot. Thank you very much. But now I have a couple of questions in terms of what next is okay. Hunter up to? Yeah, yeah. So um, what, what we, you know, what we're doing uh, day in and day out here, here at Thrive Plan is working with big clients doing typically market research studies um, and consulting um, using some of the principles we've talked about um, and, and, and some we haven't touched on as much in the world of um, neuropsychology. So our approach brings people from the world of academia, neuroscientists, PhDs, alongside people like me who are more um, marketing strategy backgrounds. Um, and we've merged that together to go and study um, you know, segments and, and audiences to, and, and understand what pre-consciously is driving and hindering people. So, you know, this has been an interesting time. Um, we've had a lot of opportunity, you know, we've, we've stayed relatively busy through this, but we've had a lot of opportunity to sharpen the saw, as they say, and really kind of work on our, ourselves and our processes. So we, we have some pretty exciting things coming up actually for, for next year. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave a bit of a cliffhanger, but, um, but, but lots of, uh, lots of um, very data-driven, um, very implicit or non-conscious ways of measuring um, human behavior and bringing that to bear for those partners um, that, that we work with. That's lovely. One final question for you, Hunter. Any book <laughs> recommendations for me? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, man, I've read so many. You know, nothing that, that you probably haven't heard of. Um, hmm. Nothing's springing to mind as any that are uh, um, there. There's one. There's one that, that I, I got a lot out of. Um, that's called Collective Disruption uh, from a guy called Mike Dockerty, and it's a uh, it, it's it's somewhat related to, um, to to some of the principles that I talk about. A little more of a a scientific and methodological approach um, to how. Um, sort of the wisdom of the tribe um, and, and using some of those weak ties principles to drive innovation disruption. That's an interesting one you might check out. Oh, I would go ahead and do that. Thank you very much, Hunter. Yeah. I enjoyed talking with you. Thank you.